morning, church. Whew, happy Easter. He is risen. All right, okay, we, we haven't practiced this, so we're going to go over this again. Anytime a pastor says he is risen, your response is he is risen indeed, okay? Let's try it one more time. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Ooh, yeah, you got it. You know how you can tell it's going to be an awesome day? When the youth are sitting on the front row and no one had to pay them. You know what I'm saying? There's no bribing going on or anything. Tion, you can bring me down just a little bit here in my house. and I got a strong voice today. I'm fired up and ready to go. He is not dead. He is not in the grave. There is no tombstone you can go to and see, like, go place flowers at. You know what I'm saying? You don't have to do that. In fact, I saw the most awesome T-shirt, and it just it says it all. Take a look at it right here. I love this. It says, in memory of, oh, wait, he's alive. What? That is awesome. That is so perfect for today. He is not in the grave. This is what separates Christianity from everything else. There's no shrine. Don't go have to visit him and say, oh, what a sad day. Today is a happy day. I know Friday, we have Good Friday, and it's rough. And last Sunday, I sent you out on a really somber note. Remember, we hung the cross in black, and, 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 and it was, a, it was a, a very dark time. And it's okay. It's good to remember. The devil would love nothing more than for us to forget all Jesus went through for us. He would love for us to gloss right over that and just kind of, it's no big deal. It is a big deal. It changed everything. Every year, thousands of people make pilgrimages all over the, the country, all over the world, really, to go pay homage or respect to shrines and different things. There's one in the Italian Alps. Here's an actual picture of people hiking this mountain here. This is not the Von Traps. These are some people going up looking for this path that leads to various stations of the cross. If you're not familiar with those, what they are, they're little shrines every so often where you can stop and reflect on the last hours of Jesus' life. You can go a few feet, you can stop, you can pray, you can take all the time you want, and it's a beautiful moment. On this particular path, one tourist made it to the top, and at the top of the mountain was this huge cross. And he said, this is where everybody stopped, and everybody prayed, and people wept, and they remembered all he went through, the sacrifice on the cross. But he said, something dawned on him. This is where apparently everybody stopped. And nobody made it any farther than that. But as he looked, he found the trail actually kept going beyond the cross. There was a worn footpath that everyone took, but there was a lesser traveled road that went beyond the cross. In fact, he, he could tell right away it was neglected because it had grown over. And there were thickets and brambles and all kinds of overbrush. And he said he cleared it out and he walked and went around the corner of this mountain and there was one more station of the cross that no one had visited. Guess what it was? The empty tomb. Yes, the resurrection. And then he said it dawned on him as he thought about it. He said everyone was aware of the cross and everyone had made it that far, but very few ventured further. The cross was where they stopped. And that's how it is with us in America, especially at Easter. There are so many people who know about the cross, and they know the message, and they know the heartbreak, and they know the despair, and we hang the black drapes over it, and we, we recognize the pain of that moment, but that's not where it ends. The good stuff happens later. This is what separates us. This is what gives us a pep in our step and reason for hope in a world that seems to be spinning crazy. This is where we get the good news. The victory was here. This is where death was defeated. This is why it is so important to grasp and understand this is what proves Jesus is who he says he is, the empty tomb. So if you're ready to dive into Scripture and see it with a fresh look, turn with me to Matthew 28. This is going to be awesome. Matthew 28, while you pull that up, let me welcome those who are streaming with us. It is good to have you with us as well. Thanks for tuning in. God bless you and happy Easter to you. Matthew 28, we're going to read verses 1 through 6. Everybody got it? All right, start with me on verse 1, and it says, After the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. Remember that. We're going to come back to that. His appearance was dingy and not very impressive. What say? What did you say? Like lightning? His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel then turned, said to the women, don't be afraid, 
For I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Wow. There it is, church. This is the good news happening right before our eyes. I want to point out some amazing things that I learned just this week as I was studying these hidden gems. And you know me, I'm so excited to share these things. I'm a Bible nerd when it comes. I, just, I love God's word and I want to just see what he has. And there is some stuff hiding in plain sight that I have never caught. First thing I want you to notice is notice there, there's a mighty angel that shows up. This was not just like God sent some dainty little weak angel. We gloss over this part, but the angel showed up, and he's able to move the stone. It's not like he was struggling, like, I'm going to try to pull this. Oh, it's so heavy. It's so, I wish I could let you. Mary, I'm going to hold this open just a smidge. You peek inside, make sure he's gone. It wasn't like that. The original Greek, in, if you read the Gospel of John, it actually says, it reads that he implies the angel picks up the stone and moves it, like flings it. The stone, we estimate, between three and 4,000 pounds. That's the size of us picking up a Chrysler town and country minivan and flinging it. Okay? But it doesn't stop there. Notice what the angel, I love the angel's demeanor here. The angel, so he flings this away like, like a paperweight, but it doesn't stop there. It says, then he sat on it. Boom. You know, I mean, just picture this. Like, that just happened. Take that, devil. And then... And I just picture this defiance and this triumph, this angel is just like, yeah, what you meant for evil, devil, check out what's about to happen. Go look inside. And he just boo, puts it down. He sat on it. Why did God put that in there? That's important to know. He sits on the stone. I just love it. I just pictured it. But honestly, I've never caught that before. And as I'm reading this, I think, wow, look at this great thing. But it doesn't stop there. Notice what the soldiers do. This is so beautiful. It says these trained and these rugged, professional, burly soldiers shook with fear and became as dead men. Y'all, this is so good. They were scared for their life. Have you ever been so fearful, so afraid of something that you passed out? Have you ever known anyone who's been so frightened they passed out? I mean, it's a rare thing, right? So full of fear. I've been, I've been scared a couple times. I've never fainted or passed out. But when I picture this, I think, y'all, you ever heard of fainting goats? <laughs> I kid you not, this is a real thing. Fainting goats are so adorable. I want one. The, here's a picture of one before it faints. Look how beautiful. Aw, right? It's so cuddly, and it's so pretty, and you're like, I, you want one, don't you? You know you want to get rid of the family dog and get a fainting goat. The, here's the problem with them. They scare easily. And if you come up behind them, and you scare, I, I'm not kidding. Picks or it didn't happen. Here it is. Look at this. This is what happens after they faint. I kid you not, when you scare them, they literally go rigid. <laughs> and they stop like that. And that's how I picture the guards at the tomb. I picture these guards are like, oh, you know, here we are. we got to guard this tomb. It's a dead man. How hard can this be? And then, boom, the angel shows up like lightning. And they're just like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, you picture this beautiful image, and, and these guards, they think they're so tough. They think they're so strong. But don't miss this terrific irony here that Matthew paints. This is beautiful. Remember, this should have been boring to them. This should have been so routine, right? I mean, be honest. In their eyes, they're guarding a corpse. Tough job. That's, none's ever gotten up and walked off before. How hard could this be? You know they're yawning. You know they're arrogant. You know they're bored. They're just like, okay, we got who wants to take first shift? All right, let's you do it. And, and then all of a sudden, boom, an angel shows up, and these guys look like they're dead. And the dead man is suddenly alive. Are you ready for this? Here is your truth grenade to start out the morning. The living men now become like dead men, and the dead man is now living. Think about this. Y'all, this is the ultimate switcheroo. Like, the, these soldiers did not see this coming. You want to talk about hibbity flibbity, Ricky Bobby, shake and bake, something happened. All of a sudden, these guys are backwards. The living men are like corpses, and what they thought was a corpse is now more alive than ever. That is good news. That is incredible. But that's not the most amazing part of this story. I love what happens next. The angel 
ignores the soldiers. The ones who were supposed to guard this important tomb with a seal and everything, the angel shows up and he doesn't even look their way. There's no mention. He doesn't, he told, he doesn't even give them a second glance. He's not intimidated in the least. Notice who he does talk to. The women. And guess what the angel says. It's nothing frightening. It's no big Shazam. He doesn't shoot lightning like Palpatine. He shows up and he turns to the women and he says, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. I know you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen just as he said. And then, as if to offer a personal assurance, as if to offer some some calmingness, the angel adds, come, come and see the place where he lay. Take a peek. Let not your heart be troubled. He's not there. Come, come inside. That stone, it ain't coming back. I rolled it clean away. I threw that yards away. Come, take a peek. And he sends them on their way to begin to share the message that would change the world, that would split time in half, A.D. and B.C., because of this man, because of this event. So what does this mean to us? You see, before I became a Christian, you all know my testimony. I was the lead singer of a, of a hard rock band. I had long hair. Don't laugh. I actually had hair. And things were going fine according to the flesh, according to my plan. I began to go to church, and I started hearing some stories and more stories, and then I started to actually attend church, even though I wasn't a believer. And I heard about this resurrection. And to be honest, I could probably teach that story, even not believing it. I knew it that well, and maybe you did too, but here was the one huge problem. I still didn't understand how the resurrection and a man coming back to life 2,000 years ago, how that affected me back in 1989. I I get it, I understand, but I don't understand. What does that really mean? I mean, how does that affect me? Well, here's how it affects us. It's because the same power that is used to bring Jesus back to life is the same power that can save us. It's the same power that raised him from the dead. It's the same power we are able to tap into and to live the Christian life. You see, before I came to Christ, I was a fallen man. And you probably were too. I was self-centered, not other-centered. I was sinful, not sin-forgiven. I was immoral. I was greedy. I was, you fill in the blank. That's, that's the old man. But when the Holy Spirit came in and forgave my sin and sealed me for the day of redemption, it made me a new man. And I'm so glad most of you didn't know me back then. But in this day, the Bible says old things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. Do you want that? Do you want that clean slate? Because that's what the resurrection does. That's how it happens. Death is defeated because of this day. Probably the most encouraging passage in the Bible I can share with you after the resurrection is Ephesians 1.19, and that's it right there. The same power that rose Jesus from the dead lives in us. Do we get that? That literally means to walk the Christian walk now, we have the same power available to us to live day to day that God used to bring Jesus out of the grave. That is incredible power, but I don't know if we really grasp this. See, not only does Christ and his resurrection cleanse us from our past, not only does it give us purpose for today, if you're lacking purpose, you can find it, but it also guarantees our future. When we accept Christ and the Holy Spirit is sent to literally take up residence within us, we see that that is the guarantee that when he comes back for his church, we are going. We are with him. If you're a banker, you, you would think of this as, as earnest money on a house or, or a down payment. That's how he knows to come back for us in the guarantee. He says, if I go to play, prepare a place for you, I will come back. It is all hinged on the resurrection. When we trust in the finished work of Christ, this is what happens. We invite him. We repent of our sins. It's not just praying a simple prayer. It has nothing to do with that. It's it's talking about a genuine, heartfelt, God, I'm driving, I'm tired, I've been in the driver's seat so long, I've made a mess of my life, and I am getting out, and I am surrendering my life to you. I am letting you become Lord. And now we don't have to fear death, because death was defeated. We have incredible hope. Not that we guess, or we hope, or we wonder, or we pray. We know he has saved us. So that's the big picture. That's the bird's eye view I wanted to share of the good news. Today, I promised you something deeper something granular. and We're going in deep, and I want to share with you what having a resurrected body is really like, and it is awesome. It is so... Now, last week, 
I got a lot of laughs inadvertently when I talked about Lazarus and how he came back from the dead. Don't act like you wouldn't be. You'd want to see this famous man who had been dead four days and was now walking the streets. So we understood that, but what does it mean for us? What does the resurrected body look like for us? Well, to look, we can find what Jesus looked like. You see, I found at least four things that a resurrected body can do that we can't do right now in our flesh. And it is incredible. The supernatural abilities that Christ enjoyed after he was raised from the dead are evidently supernatural abilities that you and I will be able to enjoy in our resurrected bodies. How do we know this? Because 1 John tells us this, that when Christ appears, we shall be like him. Boom! I've read that a thousand times and it never dawned on me. When he appears, we shall be like him. Not he will be like us. We will be like him. And the Bible indicates he did some amazing things in the 40 days after he was resurrected in his body Christ could do some crazy, cool things. Some of them I'm going to share with you today. We know after his resurrection that Christ could do the following things. Number one, he could walk right through a locked door. John 20, 19 tells us that. He could walk right through a locked door. Now, to some of you older people, and you don't think that's impressive, let me just remind you not to lose your childlike wonder, because I guarantee you every person under the age of 20 in this room is inside going, that's awesome. That's cool. How cool is it to be? You know you are. Don't look like that's not cool to you. This is amazing. Look at what happened. Following the crucifixion, the Bible says the disciples were huddled in fear. They were upstairs, probably in the upper room, and it was locked, and they had the doors locked, and it says they were for fear of the Jews. They had locked themselves away, John 20, 19. There they were behind these locked doors, huddled like a group of frightened children who had just lost their father. That's how they felt. And I don't blame them a bit. I would be just like them, probably cowering in the corner. And it says they were stunned when Jesus suddenly came into the locked room and appeared before them. Not just stunned by his appearance. They were stunned because he was made of flesh and bones. Remember that? He even talks to Thomas. He says, come. The spirit doesn't have, I'm not a ghost. Doesn't have flesh and bones like me. Come. Feel my wounds. Thomas, come put your hand here in my side. Feel where the spear went. They could literally touch him and feel him. So how in the world did this very real resurrected body move through a solid object like a wall or a door? Because in our natural bodies, that's impossible. Have you done it lately? I could try all day long to run through that wall and mean it with all my heart, but I wouldn't bet on me to win that battle. That wall would stop me. And that was so amazing. What, this, is a, this is a mystery. Paul talked about these mysteries in the New Testament. He said this in 1 Corinthians 15, that the resurrection and the new bodies of the dead we would receive are a mystery. And it is a beautiful, glorious mystery. But it's just the top of, of the iceberg here. If Christ was enabled in his newly raised, resurrected body to pass through solid objects, and according to 1 John, we will be like him, then it stands to reason in our resurrected bodies, we will be able to do things similar to that. Now, if you're stoic and that doesn't resonate with you and that doesn't get you moderately excited about what is coming for your resurrected body, then perhaps this one will. Christ could eat food with his disciples. Yes, thank you. We have three honest people in here. Y'all, don't you for a minute act like that's not a big deal to you. I have seen some of you all eat. I have seen, in fact, we have some pictures of you when the dinner bell is rung as you make it. This is... Don't act like it's not a big deal. Christ ate with his disciples. This is so amazing. Thank you, Lord. Evidently, we'll be able to eat. Even though we do not have to, here's the mystery. We know, without a fact, without a shadow of a doubt, he ate fish in the presence of his disciples in Luke 24, after he came back. We know that. For some reason, we think, oh, heavenly bodies don't need that, and angels can't eat even if they want to and stuff, even if it's called manna and angel's food and it came down from heaven and we call it that. But we have all these things. Remember, we know there's food in heaven because Jesus talked about it. The scriptures tell us there is a tree of life waiting in the new heavenly city with 12 blossoms of fruit that bloom a new fruit each month. We know that. We know there's a crystal stream flowing from the, the throne of God. We see that. We know that there's a marriage supper of the Lamb waiting for us in heaven. We know that. It's a marriage supper. Like, a supper. It's not fake food. It's not like we come and, oh my goodness, we pass these beautiful tables and they're loaded down with this fruits from the, the original tree and, oh, it's so awesome. We go to reach out and Jesus goes, no, that's just for looks. 
There's nothing fake about God, and there's nothing fake. Why would there be a teasing table as the first thing you walk into? It doesn't make sense. Heaven is not weird. Y'all remember that? We thought heaven is home. You will feel more at home there than you ever have here. It is absolutely everything you've hoped for, and then some. We talk about the marriage supper of the Lamb. We did a big series on this. Christ himself even mentioned he would not drink of this cup again until when? Until he drinks it anew with us in the kingdom to come. He talked about that. So we know he ate food with his disciples. Here's the mystery. Evidently, there's no need for digestion. There's no heavenly bathrooms. There's none of that. We don't see any of that. So you're able to eat and drink and enjoy life and being in the presence of the Lord, but it is not for sustenance. It is a beautiful mystery. And that means we can eat. And I'm not worried about getting fat. <laughs> Think about that. That's a miracle. That is incredible stuff. But that's, that's just part of the resurrected body. The third thing I said, as I look at Christ's life, point number three, he could reappear and disappear at will. Do we realize this? It wasn't a one-time event where he just walked through a room and surprised the disciples. He was at the tomb early that morning, and he spoke with Mary. Remember that famous line that says, hey, don't, don't touch me yet. Don't cling to me. I have not yet ascended to my father. So he sends to the father, and we know he comes back because later that night he's seen miles away walking on a road to Emmaus. Remember that? And he's walking with some lesser disciples, only one of them's named, and, and he, he, he gets to the town, and they beg him to stay. Hey, stay and eat with us. It's getting late. And Jesus says, okay, fine, I'll stay. So he sits down to eat, and they break the bread, and apparently every, some way he broke the bread, either tipped them off or the scales were dropped from their eyes, but they recognized it's Jesus, and it says immediately, boom, he disappeared from their sight. He vanished. He didn't get up and walk away. I promise this was not a magic trick. He didn't be like, I'm going to break some bread. What's that over there? You know, he's not hiding behind the ficus tree. He vanished, church. He vanished before their sight, plain as day. They were looking at him one minute, they're talking. The next minute, he's gone. In his new body, Christ was clearly not limited to space and time like we are. He understood he could travel to and from distant locations without hindrances. Y'all remember an angel could be in heaven one minute ministering and then come and minister on, on earth and then in a flash be right back. And if Christ can ascend to heaven and make it back, and Stephen see him later standing at the right hand of the Father, right when he was about to be stoned, clearly Christ was able to travel in the same manner as the angels. And if we will be like him, then why would our resurrected bodies have sudden limitations? It doesn't make sense. So evidently, Christ could be transported from one dimension of the earth to the heavenly dimension back and forth simply by thinking where he wanted to go, and it was accomplished. So can angels. We see that. So... I was listening to, uh, I think it was David Jeremiah preaching this great sermon about the, the heavenly kingdom and the new Jerusalem coming down in this grand city that's 1,500 miles wide, 1,500 miles deep, and just as tall as it is wide, this massive cube. That city alone is the size of from L.A. to New York. That's about 1,500 miles. It's massive. And one person asked the question, says, how are we going to travel in the new Jerusalem? How, I mean, if you're going to, I want to go hear what Moses is saying, but I know he's up on the 58th floor because he said, I prepare a place for you, and I... Tell them I'll be there in November. I'm going to start walking. It's not like that. Boom. And then David Jeremiah goes, did you forget you have a resurrected, glorified body that can do what Christ can do? I was like, this is, of course. It's been right there all along. We just shortchange what God has in store for us. Never mind the fact that there's no more pain, no more arthritis, no more diabetes, no more hair loss. There's none of that. It is going to be amazing. But probably the most personal thing that I noticed a resurrected body can do that we don't really grasp right now. Christ could be touched by his disciples. Now, why is this significant? Because if you have lived on this earth long at all, you have probably sent a loved one on ahead. You have probably held somebody's hand for the last minute as they breathe here and they take their next breath in glory. If not, that time's coming. Maybe you know someone. It could be a loved one. It could be a family member. It could be a spouse, a child, a mom, a dad. This is amazing. Christ could be touched by his disciples in a resurrected body. How weird would heaven be if we arrive and we see, and we know we have knowledge of this, we see loved ones who have gone on to be with the Lord, and we go to hug them, and they're just a hologram or a 3D image, or some unembodied, disembodied spirit. 
This is not a Patrick Swayze moment. This is not ghost. This is one of those things where you come and Jesus said you will see his scars. You will know him. We will know as we're known, and it will be so obvious. If that person that you sent on was in a saving covenant relationship with Christ, then all the sorrow and all the pain that overwhelms us in this life is gone and replaced by the hope we will be with them again. We will see them again. This is, this is incredible. The thought of seeing them again. Paul put it this way. Read this. This is so powerful. He says this. And if there's no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is useless. Oh, and by the way, you're still in your sins. What? In that case, all who have died believing in Christ are lost. And if our hope in Christ is only for this life, <laughs> we of all people should be the most pitied. What pitiful people if we have no hope beyond just this life. Paul is admitting this much. As believers, we have so much to look forward to. And I believe we are going to be amazed at how much God has still hidden from us and is going to surprise us when we slip past that border. It's going to be phenomenal when we wake up and we see the throne and we hear the angels, and we see the seraphim and the burning ones with the six wings, and we see the ones who are called alive with flames. And is that the flaming sword that God put at the mouth of the Garden of Eden when he kicked them out? And is that Moses? Are you kidding? I get to see Daniel and talk. What was the fire and furnace like? And our loved ones, and we're going on and on, and we see the sea of glass and the gold, and it's unbelievable. All that pales compared to the one you'll be able to stand in his presence and look and communicate and know and have all the questions and have eternity to ask one right after the other. None of that matters, though, if you haven't made your reservation. None of that matters if you did not RSVP. Have you done that? See, I lived for years thinking I had. I truly did. I was a good guy. You could probably ask people, is that a Christian? And I would say half of my friends would go, Something's, he, he, he's searching. I think he's probably a good guy. Do you think he would spend eternity with the Lord? Do you think he's been forgiven? Uh, probably. No. <laughs> Not at all. I was searching. I was hungry. But I hadn't RSVP'd. I had not accepted what Christ had done on the cross in my place. He being blameless, the sacrifice that can take away sins. Me not being blameless that would die in my sins. There was an amazing true story that I just read about of the famous opera singer, Ruth Anna Metzger. You're not going to believe what happened to her. She was used to being asked all the time to sing at weddings and receptions and stuff. That's what famous opera singers get paid a lot of money to do. But she had never been asked to sing at the wedding of a multimillionaire. And she got an invitation in the mail, and she was blown away. And she quickly accepted the chance to sing at this wedding. And she looked and she knew right away this was high rollers because the reception was going to be held at the tallest skyscraper in the Northwest. It was Seattle's uh, Columbia Tower. If you've ever been there, you know that this thing is amazing. She went up to the top and it was getting close to sundown. She'd already sung at the wedding. And here was the view that she got to just sit for an hour in the lounge with all the hundreds of guests waiting to go up to the top floor. And as the sun set, the city lights came alive and it looked like this in this next photo. And it was breathtaking. And she said, everybody was dressed to the nines. Even the waiters would come up and give you unlimited exotic drinks, whatever you wanted. I'm sure it was sparkling apple cider and any kind of hors d'oeuvre you could want, full tuxedos. She said, they stayed there on that ground floor. This is the top two floors of the skyscraper. That whole first floor, you can look up into the incredible feast that was waiting for them. And she said for an hour, they just mingled and laughed and music was playing and she was getting full. And man, people were like, just love it. Oh, you sang so great. No, oh, can I get your autograph and stuff? Then it happened. 60 minutes into this just reverie, the bride and the groom showed up. And the place erupted. They were clapping. They were so, I mean, you could, every eye was on them. And they walked right through the crowd. The crowd parted. And they went to the foot of a glass and brass stairway. And they went. And there was this red satin bow blocking people off. And they took these scissors. And they had this thing. And they were announced, husband and wife. And they clipped this ribbon ceremony. And it fell. And everybody just cheered. And they went up the stairs, the bride and groom, to start the feast. They were the first ones up, and then a sea of people just crushed up the stairs. As they got to the top, Ruth Anna said, 
she was stopped by a lovely gentleman, again in a tuxedo, with this gorgeous bound book. And in it was calligraphied everybody's name. And he stopped, and one by one, people would say their name. If they had trouble with it, they would spell it. He would let them in. They get to Ruth Anna, and he says, can I have your name? And she says, yes, I'm Ruth Anna Metzger. This is my husband, Dr. Roy Metzger. The gentleman looked down at his book, and he says, I'm having trouble finding it. Could you spell it for me, please? So she said, she spelled it slowly and very clearly. And this time, he went through every single page looking, and his brow got more and more furrowed. You know, you think you know where this is going, but you do not. And he flipped through the pages, and he said, I'm so sorry, I am not finding your name in this registry. Unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to let you in. And Ruthanna said, you don't understand. I just sang at the wedding. I'm not some guy off the street trying to sneak in here and get a free bite to eat. I'm, I'm Ruth. This is Dr. Roy. I heard your name, but you're not in here. She says, I sang at the wedding. Surely I can come to the wedding reception. Here's what he said. He said, it doesn't matter who you are or what you did. Without your name written in this book, you cannot pass. You cannot attend. There is no table setting for you. There is no food prepared for you. I'm sorry. And with that, he gestured for the head bellwaiter to come and escort them. She said she had a split moment, and she thought, if I can find the bride and groom, I am going to run to him and say, hey, show me that I can get in. Tell this guy that I'm with you. But she saw that they were on the opposite side of this huge rotating restaurant, and they were surrounded by 100 guests. She said, not going to make a difference. He will never hear me. And be before she could even finish that thought, the head waiter came up and said, if you'll follow me, please. She thought for a split second there was hope. They walked by all the tables of smoked salmon, filet mignon, shrimp, all kinds of fountains of chocolate and things. I don't even know what they are. And then she said huge ice sculptures that were just gorgeous. She walked right on by it, past the orchestra, who had now worn white tuxedos, and they were getting ready to play the most incredible music, and they took him through the kitchen to a service elevator. And the head waiter opened the door to this skyscraper elevator that was private access, ushered him in, reached in, and hit G for ground, and the doors closed as he stepped out. They have never felt more alone. Ruthanna would go on to write this. As we sat there, thankfully, my husband thoughtfully did not say a word, nor did I. As we drove out of the Columbia Tower garage, we both remained stone silent. After driving several minutes in silence, my husband Roy reached over and he gently put his hand on my arm and said, sweetheart, what happened? And then I remembered. When the invitation arrived for that reception, I was incredibly busy that day. I wasn't busy with anything important. I was just busy with life. I set it aside, and I never got around to RSVP. I never thought, surely the singer at a reception who had done such a good work for this wedding for free would not be permitted to the reception. She said, as we began to drive further, I started to cry, and then I broke into a full-blown weep. I wasn't weeping because I had just missed the most lavish banquet of my life. I was weeping because suddenly I knew what it must be like for the people as they stand before the entrance of heaven, people who were just too busy to respond to Christ's invitation to his heavenly banquet, people who meant well, people who had assumed that they were decent people, they'd done good, they gave to charitable things, they even served in the church, they played in the band, and they even served in the nursery, and they thought that might be enough to have the points lead them into heaven. But they didn't have their names written in the Lamb's Book of Life. It was not found there. People who did not have time to respond to his gracious invitation, they never had their sins forgiven. They never accepted his love and his blameless sacrifice. Wow. Have you? I did. I'm, I'm not ashamed to say it. But for the shed blood of Jesus, there go I that would be me, turned away. You don't have to do that. The tomb is empty. Death has been defeated. You can know. You don't have to guess. You don't have to hope or pray or wonder. Scripture says you can know today. Pray with me. Father God, in the quiet of this moment, 
Lord, we acknowledge that we have fallen short of the goal. Your word tells us that. We agree with you, Lord, that apart from you, we are left in our sins. God, we confess our sin to you today. We ask that you forgive us. Lord, we know that the blood of the lamb, the perfect sacrifice, is the only thing that washes sin away. And God, you did not have to write yourself into the story, but you did it, and you did it willingly, laying down your life. And we are eternally grateful. We don't even know how grateful we will be until we stand in awe and see you face to face. But Lord, in our own finite way, we say thank you. And we invite you, Holy Spirit, to enter our life. Seal us for the day of redemption. Take us off the throne of our hearts, and Lord, you take your rightful place. Give us purpose. Give us passion. Help us to live a selfless life like Jesus did. Lord, we're done playing games. God, we are done trying to make it our own way, trying to steer the, the, the course of our own life. We invite you, the grand captain, to take your rightful place. Forgive us for our sins. Lord, give us the holy desire to walk 180 degrees in repentance, to live a new life empowered by your spirit. We ask this now in Jesus' powerful name. Amen and amen. If you prayed that prayer, would you let me know sometime today? You don't have to come down now. You can if you like. We're going to stand in just a moment and sing a final song. That's how we end our services. If you'd like to come and pray, no one will bother you. You can come and kneel at the altar. You can just give thanks to God for 30 seconds for overcoming sin and death. Whatever God's leading you to do, just be obedient today. Maybe you want to talk to somebody about what does it mean to follow Christ deeper. Maybe you've never been baptized and you know that's the next step. Come talk to me about that. Whether it's now during the song or after church, I would love to talk to you, pray with you about it. Just follow through. Don't let the devil steal your joy today. Be obedient. He is risen. He has defeated death. Let's stand together. As we sing these words, the altar is open. You come, just be obedient.